1995, director and star Mel Gibson gave the world a heart-stirring retelling of a warrior poet who took on an empire. In 2020, we return to the world of peated scotch. The film is Braveheart. The whiskey is Lefroy Lore. And we'll review them both. This is The, the Film and, and Whiskey, whiskey Podcast. Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at the 1995 film Braveheart. Brad, we have finally arrived at the film that won the Best Picture Oscar for the year of 1995, uh, somewhat controversially. And it seems like in a lot of corners, this movie uh, has been really, really downplayed. I just saw a list this past week of like the 10 worst best picture winners of all time and this movie was on the list and so i'm actually really excited to talk about this movie brad because i think there are a lot of different directions we can go with this film do we talk about the movie itself do we talk about how apparently historically inaccurate it was do we talk about mel gibson and and the problematic things that arise out of watching his movies now so I, i'm really excited to get into this one but before we go any further, Brad, tell me your initial thoughts when when you saw Braveheart on the list of movies for this season. I mean, did you did you have a lot of familiarity with the movie? Oh, Bob, I was super pumped. I mean, this is a movie I've probably seen five, six times now. Um, like like this viewing was fifth, sixth, maybe seventh viewing. So this is a movie I've seen plenty of times. I probably hadn't seen it until I was. I don't know, 17 or 18. Um, I, I think I might have seen it my senior year of high school. So it's a movie that in, you know, in 12 years now, I've probably seen it about every other year. So this is like required viewing in the G household. <laughs> um, friend of show Jordan McCain had never seen it. So we made him sit down and watch it. Uh, it's it's my it's one of my wife's favorite movies of all time. Wow. So like I, I'm I'm pretty well steeped in Braveheart. Yeah, I guess so. You know, I remember this movie being on TV all the time growing up, and, and I think it probably still is, but this was the kind of movie you'd see on, like, AMC or Bravo, and it would end up being four hours long just because of all the commercials they would throw into it. I've probably seen bits and pieces of this movie, you know, 25, 30 times in my life, but I can't remember the last time I sat down and watched it all the way through. It's been well over a decade for me, I would think. And it was a really interesting viewing experience, Brad, because this is a three hour long movie and it's not the first three hour movie that we've done on this show. We've watched a lot of long movies, I feel like. But watching this movie, Brad, it felt every bit of three hours long. And I don't know if you had the same reaction I did, but especially the first 45 minutes or so, it was like the longest, slowest movie I'd ever seen until, you know, the inciting incident, which we're going to talk about. Like the the 45 minute prologue to this movie was it just dragged so much. Yeah. And, and Bob, I think one of the things I'm going to point to, which we might be getting into a technical aspect of the film kind of quickly here, but the music in this movie is so slow and melodramatic. And every scene is like, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> and it's all just like drawn out and long and it takes forever to get anywhere. And it's the middle of the 90s, so we got some awesome slow-mo going oh, yeah. on. And, and you know what, Bob? I freaking love it, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just I just eat it right uh... up. And I know that some of that is nostalgia. I know that some of that is just, I don't know. There's something about it that I still love to this day. Uh, but yeah, there, there's issues with the pacing in this movie. And I know we're going to get into that. But I'm getting a little itchy here, Bob, and I think it's because I haven't been able to tell everyone in Film and Whiskey Nation the plot of this movie. Yeah, that means it's time for us to move into our favorite segment, which is called Brad Explains. This is the part of the podcast where Brad breaks down the plot of the movie that he has just seen, often for the first time. But we are on a roll this season. Brad's seen most every movie this season. So, Brad, having seen this movie so many times, you should be able to very easily break down the plot in a spoiler-filled way for our listeners of the movie Braveheart. 
Bob, this movie is is it's so long and yet it has such a simple plot, right? The movie starts off with a young William Wallace um who whose father is not even a nobleman, but he he kind of gets involved in the local politics and a bunch of his friends get murdered by the evil English king Edward Longshanks and his father and brother go off to fight, they're killed in the war and Wallace is raised by his uncle Argyle. Uh, as an adult, he returns to his homeland and be- plans to be a farmer and, you know, take a, take a wife, um, which is apparently this young girl who he knew as a child. She's now grown up. He wants to marry her, have a farm, raise some kids, just, you know, be pretty peaceful, chill kind of guy, even though he, like, speaks French and, he, and he's super smart now. But but he's just going to be a farmer. And then the the local English garrison, there's this creepy old dude that tries to rape his young wife that he married in secret, and he ends up killing some Englishmen, and in retaliation, the local Eng- English magistrate kills Murrin, his wife. And, I mean, Mel Gibson just loses it. He He just goes nuts, kills the magistrate, kills all the local troops, goes to the local English lord, kills the English lord, uh, and starts a rebellion. And from that point on, the movie is about the Scottish fight for freedom. There's infighting among the Scottish nobles who all have English lands down in the south. And so they're kind of tied up there that if they cause a rebellion, it's going to be economically bad for them. And uh, it, it's about Robert the Bruce, who is the presumptive rightful king to Scotland and how his father is manipulative and trying to play both sides all the time. Um, It's about a young French princess who is in a terrible marriage to Longshank's son and how she is sent to try to broker peace with Wallace. Man, I'm trying to think there's so many plot points going on, Bob. But by the end of the film, uh, Wallace is betrayed by his Scottish allies. He is captured by the English. They draw and quarter him. They castrate him. And they just try to get him to betray his people to cry out mercy and at the end of the film, we we hear him cry out freedom and and he dies and he inspires Robert the Bruce to unite the lands, to fight off the English rule. And in real life, Robert the Bruce did do this and he united Scotland for a hundred years or so. It was probably their most prosperous period in history. So there, there you have it, Bob. Braveheart. Well, Brad, thank you for that breakdown of the movie. This is a, an incredibly popular movie, and I, I think we're going to have a hard time today, or at least I am, because I've always felt kind of caught between the two poles of appreciation of this movie. So, like, I think critics really enjoyed this movie when it came out, and kind of like for what it was. In, in some ways, it was like the old sword and sandals gladiator type of epics that you would get in the 50s and 60s in Hollywood, and this was just transplanted to Scotland. They appreciated it for what it was, and then all of a sudden, it got... Paramount's backing for Oscars and it kind of it won the Oscar over films that people thought were more deserving than this. And I think the critical backlash as a result of that has always kind of carried over with this movie. It, you know, it's kind of like Green Book in a way. Got favorable reviews and then all of a sudden it starts winning Oscars and everybody's like, oh, this movie sucks. I don't think this movie sucks. But on the other polar opposite of that, I think this is also kind of like everyone's dad's favorite movie. And it like you said Brad it's like a fixture in so many american households now because it's so quotable like there's just there's so many easily digestible things about this movie you have mel gibson in blue face paint shouting they can never take our freedom that scene never fails to inspire people and where i think i land is kind of somewhere in between which is i think this movie is good for what it is i think it's an enjoyable movie i don't think it deserved to win any sort of academy awards and I think it's got like kind of a weird mixed legacy now because people who hate Mel Gibson now are like they continue to take it out on this movie. And then there's the people who don't care about what the critics say at all, who continue to elevate this movie to like, oh, it's one of the best films ever made. And I don't really fall into either one of those camps. Yeah, Bob, I, I feel like it's easy to find yourself, especially in today's day and age. It's easy to just go to one extreme or the other. But, you know, when I when I just sit down and watch this movie and just let it be what it is, like it's it's full of a bunch of amazing set pieces of these big battles, these big fights. You just get all these amazing shots. 
and and you let it be what it is. It's a melodramatic love story of a man whose wife has been killed and he finds himself fighting not only for a national cause, but for a personal cause. And he has a dedication to get the job done no matter what. I just think it's a it's a really well made movie. Um, there are problems with it. There are issues with it. Uh, do I think it should have received the best picture? Uh, I don't know. I I mean I I think it would be if that if this movie came out in any year of the nineties. I can't see any reason why it shouldn't have been considered for best picture. But you know maybe ninety five was just the perfect year for it to win. I I don't know. Yeah, Brad, I agree with pretty much everything you're saying. I will say this, though, you know, when we talked about the the two Harry Potter movies that we did this season, Prisoner of Azkaban and Goblet of Fire, we spent a lot of time talking about the differences between Alfonso Cuaron and Mike Newell as directors. And Mel Gibson directed this film in addition to starring in it. And I think the best thing that you can really say about Mel Gibson as a director, and I don't I don't really intend this as an insult, but the best thing that you can really say about him as a director is that he's competent. I think he gets better with some of the later films that he made, but there's not a lot of artistry here. Like, he he films the battle scenes as they need to be filmed. There's a lot of cutaways to people getting impaled and things like that. And, like, I think the the film is really well edited. I think the, the battle sequences flow really well. Even in the midst of the chaos of battle, you have a pretty clear sense of what's going on and where people are moving and things like that. I think that if they had plugged any other director into this movie... I think we'd have a better film, even with the same script, even with the same cast, just because I think that that Mel Gibson's direction is is pretty rote. I mean, it's it's very there's not a lot of moving, you know, camera shots. It's very static. Mel Gibson being such a famous actor and working with so many directors over the course of his career up to this point, he picked up a lot in terms of how to shoot a movie, how to effectively you know, lead a crew as a director. And he's very competent and it makes for a good movie. But I just can't help but wonder, like, you know, if if James Cameron hadn't been busy making Titanic, what would he have done with this movie? You know, and and that's not to say anything about Mel Gibson's performance as an actor. I just think that we could have had this movie punched up a notch if we didn't have Mel Gibson as the director, because I think he leans into some pretty obvious tendencies with the way he portrays characters, with the way he films battle sequences that I would have liked to seen somebody with a little bit more of like an artistic eye kind of tackle that. Yeah, I mean, uh, there wasn't enough father-son issues in here to attract this director, but, like, I'm curious to see what Steven Spielberg could have done with this. Absolutely. And and so you you do kind of wonder, with Mel Gibson, in a certain sense, as a young director directing this movie, you wonder, like, man, what, what could have been? Could it have been a little bit less melodramatic and drawn out? Could it have been tighter in certain scenes? Um, could you have a could you have had a little more character development, you know, for anyone other than William Wallace? Uh, and, and even his character development was like a angry young child to a know it all want to be a shepherd young man to a warrior hell bent on revenge. Like like that's it. <laughs> that's all you get from him. Right. And, and, and so you just kind of wonder, man, like if there just been a little bit more qualified, I don't know, experienced of a director, you might have gotten a little more out of it. Right. And I think this is where, like, for for those people who listen to this podcast and kind of wonder sometimes, as we've wondered aloud sometimes, you know, where do you put the blame for director versus writer or director versus editor? I think this is one of those kind of classic textbook examples where, yes, I think the script really paints in broad strokes as well, but a director who knows what he's doing a little more behind the camera can kind of cover up some of those more broadly drawn characters and and uh, scenarios and things like that. Like, I'm thinking specifically of the way that Mel Gibson portrays good versus evil in this movie. And again, the script doesn't really give you a ton to work with there. Like, Longshanks is the most mustache-twistingly bad villain. You know, he hates the Scottish and he hates the Irish and he just talks... In such a you know highfalutin way that you're supposed to hate him because he's not a man of the people. I understand all that, but like you know when the English come and raid their village and the bad guy takes Mel Gibson's wife and ties her up and then he like licks her face. I'm like really like Mel did do you have to go to such extremes in how it, it's just like he takes the most obvious route in portraying his characters in in such stark black and white kind of like old timey western characters and i think for me it was like okay i, I would have liked to have seen him 
give these characters a little more shades of gray, not even like in adding dialogue for them or anything like that, but just in how he, you know, coaxed these performances out of some of the people in this movie. Yeah, I, I'm I'm right there with you, Bob. And I, and I also struggle. Th- this is just kind of a technical question. Like, how weird is it to have not only your director being the person telling you what to do, but like he's also the main actor on the stage. So like, it's got to be weird as an actor to have, you know, your coworker, the person that's, you know, acting with you on stage to also be the person like giving you notes and telling you what to do. And I, I just always feel like that would be a weird place to be a almost like a player manager in baseball. Like like you're out there acting and you're behind the camera and you're in the editing room. Uh, it just seems like a weird thing. Yeah. And I, I think in a way it's it's kind of the unspoken thing that it's always really a vanity project. Like, I don't know that anyone ever needs to be the actor and the director. Like there's a few times in Hollywood history where that's worked brilliantly. You know, and we have one of those instances coming up here in a few weeks when we look at Citizen Kane. but. I just imagine like what it must have been like for somebody like Brendan Gleeson to be on set with Mel Gibson and acting in a scene. And then Mel calls cut from in front of the camera, goes behind the camera and looks at, you know, the rushes and then starts giving you notes on your performance. But like, are you yeah. allowed to give him notes back on his performance and be like, right. hey, man, this is where you should be doing better. <laughs> or like, is that not allowed? Because yeah. he's the director, you know? Well, and this honestly kind of brings me to my next point about Mel is that one of the one of the things I hate most about this movie is the fact that in real life, the actress who played his young wife, Murrin, was about uh, 24, 25 years old. And Mel Gibson was 40 years old, 40 or 41. And I just remember thinking to myself, he looked every bit of 40 years old. And that wasn't a big deal when he's off, you know, slaying the English. But when it comes to a love story, I just kind of was like, man, like, Mel, you could have directed this movie. But I think there's other actors out there that you could have chosen for this role that were, I don't know, between the ages of like 28 and 32. Yeah, I think that's I think that's actually a really great point, Brad. And that's something we see all the time in Hollywood, that men get leading roles way later in their careers. And we just kind of suspend disbelief that there would be this weird 15 year age gap. But you're right. The problem with the way this story is structured is that. William Wallace goes from being a tiny child to Mel Gibson, and he's supposed to be like 20 years old. It really reminds me of the early scenes in something like uh, The Greatest Showman, where you've got 50-year-old Hugh Jackman playing like a 21-year-old for a good portion of the movie. It just, it doesn't really click. It doesn't really work. Aside from that, though, I will say one of the biggest compliments I can give to Mel Gibson is that I think his performance in this movie is phenomenal. I think, like... I can't imagine anybody else playing this part now that I've seen Mel Gibson in it. And I think that's really the highest compliment you can give an actor. Fight and you may die. Run and you'll live. At least a while. I'm dying in your beds many years from now. Would you be willing to train all the days from this day to that for one chance? Just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! You know, for a while, Mel Gibson was hoping to direct this movie and put somebody else in the lead role. He was talking about Brad Pitt, um, and then Brad Pitt turned it down, and so he decided to step into it himself. And I think he really does carry this movie very, very well. You know, we don't like to talk about it in 2020, but he was a bona fide movie star in every sense of the word in the 1990s. And he proves it here with his ability to carry a three hour film. Bob, I I was going to say I I had looked through different actors born in like 1963, 1964. And I will say I could not find almost any other names of actors in that range that I think could have pulled off what Mel did in this. Brad Pitt was one of those names I saw. Uh, Nicolas Cage, uh, even, you know, Russell Crowe, you know, who obviously, you know, was in Gladiator a few years later, which is kind of in the similar vein of film. But I don't think any of them could have pulled off what Mel does in this movie. He, he just gives such a spectacular performance in the fact that he is one of the most charming mass murder, mass English murdering humans, I think you could have ever cast in this role. 
he really did kind of strike a balance in the 90s between being like really charming and, and being able to be a heartthrob, but to also convincingly be an action star, you know, to carry a movie where he's swinging a sword and decapitating people. I mean, you only have a few stars in this era that can do something convincingly like that. And, you know, this was at a point where Tom Cruise hadn't really stepped into that sort of more rugged role that he's in now. He was still the young guy on the scene. It was really just like, you know, Mel Gibson, people like Harrison Ford, who could be a little bit comedic. But Mel had this edge to him coming off of the Mad Max movies and the Lethal Weapon movies that I think really put him in a category of his own. Honestly, Bob, we we talked about this a long time ago on the podcast. It's something about his sincerity in this movie, his earnestness. Like, there's something about him in this film that is eager, that is sincere, that, like, you just believe with your heart that he would do absolutely whatever it takes to free Scotland from English rule. And it's just such a believable performance. I think that's why he works so well in this role. And as much as I don't want him to be William Wallace when it comes to the romantic part, you understand it. And and as soon as he falls into the revolutionary part, I am 100% on board. Well, I think that's where the movie actually finally picks up steam, too, because I, I almost felt like everything before he gets married could have been given to us as like an opening crawl. Like it, it's just, it seems so unnecessary. Like a Star Wars crawl? Like a Star Wars. Yeah, I really do think it could have, <laughs> you know. And uh, by the way, one of my favorite things is the overbearing like bagpipes of the uh, score come on and then the movie fades up on this brilliant Scottish countryside and the word Scotland uh, comes up. I'm like, yeah, no uh, shit. Dude. Like, <laughs> <laughs> dude, it's so good though. <laughs> Like, and that's the thing. Honestly, Bob, that is the perfect expression of this movie. It's a little bit overbearing. It's beautiful. It it knows exactly what it wants to do and it shoves it in your face. And yet it's still great because of all that and despite of all that. I, I, I don't know, man. That's like the perfect description of this film. Well, Brad, while we continue to figure out where we actually fall on this movie, let's hit pause here and let's try this Lafroy lore. What do you say? Let's get to it. So today we are checking out Lefroig lore. Now, if you remember, back in season one, we tried regular 10-year Lefroig. It was our first peated scotch uh, on the podcast. I am not a huge fan of peated scotch. Brad has talked himself into becoming a fan of peated scotch somehow. Uh, like I've dr- I can, drank myself into it. Yeah, that's true. I can handle some PD scotches. I really like Ardbeg as a, a, a more PD brand. Lefroig was not one that I was a huge fan of. And I tell you what, Brad, the longer that bottle sat on my shelf, I felt like it just continued to like stew in its own juices. And every time I opened the bottle, it was more and more pungent. And I was like, I just can't do this. And then our friend Bourboneering reached out to us and he said, hey, if you really want to try some good Lefroig, they make this kind called Lefroig lore. Let me send you a sample. So we have a sample here in front of us today from our friend Bourboneering, Austin Dupree. And Lefroy Lore was added to the lineup of the distillery in 2016. It's made from a blend of whiskeys that are between 7 and 21 years old. And they have been aged in five different kinds of casks. Some of them have been aged in sherry casks. Some of them have been aged in reused PD casks. Uh, some of them were aged in a smaller barrel called a quarter cask. And so it's really a, bl- a, a masterful blend of all these different varieties of whiskeys put together. It is 96 proof or 48% alcohol, which is a bit higher than I'm used to seeing with scotch. Usually they fall right in that sort of like 80 to 90 range. So I'm expecting a little bit more punch here. And Brad, already on the nose, this smells less, I guess, intense of a campfire scent than the regular Laphroaig did. I think this is much more approachable. Yeah, Bob, this is a really nice peated scotch. Mm -hmm. It's not offensive. It's not blowing you away with all the peat. 
Um, there's some of those good traditional iodine, some of those really nice Isla notes out of it. I, I mean, this is a really nice, pleasant peated scotch. I agree. And that sherry really comes through as well. We've been talking the last few weeks about how all the Irish whiskeys we've been drinking have been finished in sherry. I'm really starting to pick up on some of those those lighter, whiny notes. And I don't think I'm getting a ton of the saltiness that comes sometimes with sherry because the peat is covering that up. And so what you really have here is basically really pleasant, floral, whiny notes mixed with, uh, you know, some of that classic Laphroaig peat. But it helps to tone the peat down a little bit. And I really like this a lot, Brad. I think I'm actually going to give this an 8 out of 10 on the nose. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you, Bob. I think it is well-deserving of an 8 out of 10, and I'm curious to see where it takes us on the taste. Well, Brad, I'm a little bit ahead of you on the taste. Oh, who? Who? Oh, man. Brad, I'm a little bit ahead of you on the taste here, and I actually had to stop myself because the, the finish kept going and kept going. I thought I was ready to talk, and I was not. It's really, really sweet on the front end, and then you get the immediate alcohol tingle of that 96 proof. As you roll it to the back of your mouth, it's like a, it really is smoky, um, but more of like a smoked meat kind of a, a, a taste than just like pure, you know, I'm like eating the coals out of a bonfire. As you swallow, you get, you get the alcohol, and it kind of comes in waves between alcohol and smoke. But it's carried through with this really, really nice sweetness all the way through that I think the 10 year was lacking. Brad, I like this a lot. I think that on the taste, I got a little bit of floral notes, almost some like rose almost smelling notes. There's all of that peat that I want, but it's not overwhelming. No. Like like I said at the start, it's not offensive in any way. Like I, I think that that peat rolls over your tongue. It just it just gently rests in your mouth and is like, hey, I'm here. I'm here for you, but but I'm not going to overwhelm you. It's it's really beautiful. I think I'm going to go ahead and give it an eight and a half on the taste. I'm going to give it a nine on the taste, Brad. I I'll tell you what, as far as peated scotches go, I don't know if I would call this like a gateway into peated scotch. It could certainly be that because it is kind of a toned down version of the peat. But this is not the same thing that I would offer somebody as like a forty dollar art bag. Like, this is definitely a little bit higher quality than that. And the thing that I keep thinking about with this whiskey is it's a whiskey that I'm chewing on as I'm drinking it. Like, it just has substance to it. It's very thick. And it's it's almost like, I, th I guess the word I would use is, like, meaty. It's a very meaty scotch. Like, if you've ever watched Parks and Recreation and you've watched Ron Swanson drink his Lagavulin, I've had Lagavulin. It is very good. But I think this might even surpass that in my book. In terms of what this is actually offering you, it is an incredibly complex scotch. I'm really enjoying it. I'm giving it a nine on taste. I feel like Ron Swanson is just going to show up at your house tomorrow and just like kick you in the groin right. for saying that. I think so, too. Yeah, Bob, th th this is growing on me. As I look to the finish, I think that this has such a pleasant smokiness to it. Like you said, it's not overwhelming you. It's not pushing you to places you don't want to go. It's just a nice, pleasant, smoky burn that just kind of, it's almost like embers at the end of the fire. They're they are just kind of simply burning there. They're keeping you warm. And I, I just, I don't feel like I'm breathing like a dragon the way I do with some peated scotches. I think I'm going to give it a, another eight and a half on the finish. Yeah, Brad, I think I'm going to drop to a seven and a half on the finish. The very first sip I took was an incredible, like, just it, like explosions happening. It, it was so wonderful to see, like, the waves that it came in, too. Second, third, fourth sip that I'm taking, it's actually not as long lasting of a finish as I thought it was. It has a lot of peaty smoke, um, but that's just lingering on my breath more than on the, the finish of the whiskey itself. It's still a very good finish, but just a slight step down from that taste. So I'm going to give it a seven and a half on finish, which takes us to overall balance. I think this is an incredibly well-balanced whiskey. The nose was was very straightforward. It's sherry and it's a little bit of peat. The taste was that as well. It's very sweet and a little bit of smoke. It, it's like they found a way to kind of mitigate how intense the peat is on their regular, you know, 10 year. And they found a really brilliant way of doing it. I think it's well balanced throughout. I'm actually going to give it a nine on balance. I'm giving it a nine as well. This is one of the best balanced whiskeys we've had in, and I would say, quite some time. 
everything that you want from this whiskey is there for you from start to finish. It's a beautifully balanced whiskey, an easy nine. And I, I'm curious, Bob, how much did this bottle of whiskey cost? Because I, I'm, I really want to get into my value score. So this is where things are going to get interesting, Brad, because in the state of Ohio, Lafroy Lore is going to cost you $99.99. This is a premier whiskey in terms of what you can find at any liquor store. And Brad, I just don't know if I can justify that price tag. You know, this is in a different category of scotch than the Glenmorangies that we've been drinking that we love so much. Um, but even then, it's twice as much as the Quinta Rubin. And that's where things get really interesting for me because I think this is one of the better scotches in terms of a peaty scotch that I've ever had. But would I pay $100 for it? I'm just not sure. I think I'd probably stick to just getting a glass or two of it at a bar and paying, you know, $12 for it. I think I'm going to give this a six on value. It's still such a good whiskey that I, I can't totally knock it for the price tag. But I don't know that I'm going to run out to the liquor store and buy this for $100. You know, Bob, if there was a peaty scotch that I would want to keep on my shelf, though, this would be it. And and yeah. I think that I think that $100 is a high price. You know, do I wish it was like 70 or 80 bucks? Sure. But I think the price is justified. And, you know, long term, if you are building a bar and you want people to be able to experience all of the variety that whiskey has to offer on a high level, then for your serious friends who really want to try a high end peated scotch, I would recommend buying this. This is a great, great bottle. $100 is a lot, but I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10 on value. So, Brad, that's actually bringing me to a 39.5 out of 50. What's that bringing your final score to? A 41 out of 50. All right. So that's bringing us to an 80.5 out of 100 or an average of a 40.25. We have finally hit the 40 plateau this season. This is now our highest rated whiskey of season three. And I think for good reason. This is a darn good whiskey. It is going to be hard for me to justify that $100 price. But if you're ever out at a bar and you see this behind the bar, I am telling you, you have to order some of this. It is such an incredible pour. I wholeheartedly recommend. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly recommend as well. It's a beautiful whiskey. And honestly, it's paired with a really beautiful movie. Honestly, Bob, I just can't wait to hear your final score on Braveheart because I feel like it's going to be lower than I want it to be. But I, I don't know. I, I just got to see where the rest of this episode takes us. Well, let's get to it, Brad. All right, so that was Lafroy Lore. We are getting back into talking about Braveheart. And Brad, we've really only talked about Mel Gibson when it comes to this movie. There are other people in this movie, for those who are listening and have never seen Braveheart before. But I think part of the reason that we've talked about Mel Gibson so much is because he's really the only big name actor in this movie. Kind of the second biggest actor in this movie is Brendan Gleeson, whom we know now as, as a really great character actor, but we know him primarily from the Harry Potter films. And and the rest of the cast is really character actors who, who don't have a lot of notoriety or fame. And so it's kind of hard to have a sustained conversation about that. But I do think that a lot of the actors in this movie give really great performances. And Brad, I, I'm anxious to hear, who do you think, besides Mel Gibson, is worth calling out for their performance? Well, I, I was thinking through the cast, and you're right. The only person I recognize is Brendan Gleeson, and that's because he's Mad-Eye Moody. And then I honestly, this might sound weird, but I recognize Brian Cox as his uncle Argyle. Oh, absolutely. He's a very famous actor. Yeah. Like, but other than those two actors, man, I could not tell you a lick about anyone else in this film. I, I think of them all. Uh, we can talk about Brendan Gleeson for a minute because I loved him in this movie. He's relatable. He's funny. But I, I think the beautiful thing is when when you write a character 
like Hamish in this movie, you know, Brendan Gleeson's character. I think that with a lesser actor, it would be easy to play them just for laughs. Like, that's the only reason they're there. There's nothing serious about them. But I think that Brendan Gleeson, in the same way that he does with Mad-Eye Moody, he brings a gravitas to the role that makes you fall in love with him. And, And I really do think he is one of the best character actors out there oh i completely agree and and again he doesn't have that much to work with like his character really is there to be the sidekick and your big introduction to him as an adult is just reenacting a scene from their childhood where they throw rocks at each other and so it's kind of like oh okay this is what brendan gleason's being given to work with here but especially that scene where his dad dies and and you get to watch this this big strong brute of a man break down crying I really do think that that Gleason kind of sinks his teeth into the meatier parts of this role and makes this a much more memorable character than it really deserves to be, to be quite honest. Well, and and you you hit on another character that I really loved was his father. And like even his father is given kind of this comedic role of like, oh, every single battle he gets a different injury. You know, in the first one, he gets shot with an arrow and then he gets his hand chopped off and. And then in the final one, he takes a sword to the gut, and that's the thing that finally, you know, finishes him off. And and I think he's a character that could just become comic relief, but there's, once again, there's just something so charming about him, and the, you know, the way he tells jokes, and the way he, uh, the way he cares about his son, and the cause that they're fighting for, that I just, I, I loved his dad in this movie. And, you know, that's that's like a lot of the characters on the Scottish side side of things. I am curious, how did you feel about the Irishman and how he like talks to God? Like, was that charming and funny for you or like over the top? So, Brad, this is kind of how I feel about everything in the movie, which is like it works well enough to work, but it doesn't completely work. Like, does that make sense? It's like if you if you. Everything in this movie is like the generic medication version of of what could be a name brand. <laughs> like like it works, yeah. but it also costs you $3 instead of $65. <laughs> and so like that goes for a lot of the acting, it goes for a lot of the script. It's very clear what this character is supposed to be doing in the movie. And the fact that he just comes in out of nowhere and then he's like I'm your most loyal person ever, but I'm crazy. I'm the wild card. It's like okay, I I see what role you're filling here. And that's kind of how I feel about pretty much every character in this movie who's not named William Wallace. It's like, yeah, they scraped something together and made it work, but it's also done in like the most obvious way possible. Well, then I I guess my question is then what like what makes this movie so epic? Because honestly, if you pick this movie apart piece by piece, the sum of its pieces isn't that great. And yet When I watch this movie and you look at the sum of all of its individual pieces, for some stinking reason, Bob, I just love this movie. You know, and and we didn't talk about it, but like when you look at the English side of things, you have Longshanks, who's just chewing up scenery. And you can tell that he was like an English stage actor, you know, like Shakespearean actor. And he's just destroying every scene that he's in. The archers are ready, sire. Not the archers. My scouts tell me their archers are miles away and no threat to us. Arrows cost money. Use up the Irish. The dead cost nothing. And his son is over the top. I actually think his son turns in a really good performance. The French princess is, is you know, sighing all over herself, falling in love with William Wallace. I, I still love her in this movie, but she's a little bit one-dimensional. Yeah. So, like, what is it about all these characters and flaws that makes me go... You know what? I still love this movie. You know, I think there, there's a couple things at play there, Brad. And I think it's a really good question. I hadn't really thought of it in those terms before because you're right. I mean, I think there are areas where the script is like really amateurishly written. The fact that they found a way to make Mel Gibson have two separate sex scenes with two separate women when the whole movie he was like, my wife is dead and I'll never love again. And then this, you know, attractive English princess comes into the picture. He's like, well, there are exceptions to the rule, you know, (laughs) it it just and I think there's also moments where it's very obvious that Mel Gibson has not really found his footing as a director. The the early sequences of young William Wallace and then the love story, I think, are actually really poorly directed. And I think Mel Gibson knew what lane he was supposed to be directing in. 
And then also kind of knew like, I, I have to include some love stuff. I don't really feel comfortable doing that. And I think you can tell that he's uncomfortable as a director in those sequences. But then, you know, it's almost like when a basketball player has a really terrible playoff series. But then in game seven, when it really counts, he just, you know what I mean? Like he just goes off. And that's what happens with Mel Gibson as a director in this film. The sequences where it really counts are the action sequences. And he knows how to direct the hell out of an action sequence. The battle sequences in this film are incredibly well directed. And I think to this day, you know, the, the, the very mimicked shots of two colliding forces coming together, I don't think it's ever been done better than in, in this film. You can feel the force of bodies colliding against each other. And I think that it was really revolutionary how incredibly violent this film was because all of the reviews, you know, from 95 are basically saying this is an incredibly gory movie. And I think that 25 years of watching people kind of rip off Mel Gibson's directorial style and get really gory with their hand to hand combat and their, you know, swords and everything else have desensitized us in that regard. But when it really counts, the scenes that we remember, the scenes that matter are the ones that Mel Gibson actually directs better than the rest of them. And so I think that's kind of why, Brad, for people who haven't watched this movie for a long time, I was surprised to turn this movie on and have 45 minutes of like sleep inducing boredom before we got to the good stuff, because the good stuff is what you remember from this film because it's done so well. I, I will say, I think sleep inducing is a little bit harsh. I In those opening 45 minutes. I, I really liked um, the child actor who plays William Wallace. Oh, sure. I think he does a really great job. The, you know, the unbelievable part of it for me was just that that little in, in between spot when Mel Gibson comes back as an adult and he's like pursuing Murren. But it's not the worst thing in the world. And if anything, I think that Mel Gibson as a director doesn't work the same way Mel Gibson does as an actor. Because you can tell that as an actor, he's eager and yeah. he's loving and he and he wants to care for Murrin and all these things. But as a director, he's trying to do the same show the same eagerness. And it I don't know why. It just doesn't translate super duper well. Well you were kind of talking about that earlier with his performance and how the earnestness really worked for you. And I feel the same way. And in fact, you know, in that the scene I keep going back to where he's on horseback and shouting freedom and getting the troops roused, I think that sequence works so well because Mel Gibson, the actor, is bailing out Mel Gibson, the director, because up to that point, you know, we haven't really seen a sustained combat sequence. And I'm kind of like on the fence about, is this really a good movie or am I just remembering it wrong? And Mel Gibson, the actor, is so committed it's almost like he's he's talking to me in that sequence where he's like, no, really, just stay with me. Like, I promise I'll give you something that you'll actually enjoy. And he's so committed to that role that I'm like, yep, I'm on board now. Having, you know, himself for his star really helped him out as a director. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you brought that scene up, Bob. That scene is so funny to me because Mel Gibson is actually a terrible horseman. And he didn't know that horse. And you can tell it because when you watch that scene... He can barely control the horse. Oh, yeah. It's going wherever and, it you wants. Know, it's going wherever the heck it wants. But it, even that gives the scene this nervous energy that you feel oozing off of Mel Gibson. It's coming from the horse. Like, you have all this, like, pent up, we are going to fight for our freedom. And, and it just works. So even accidents like that are just, uh, it's just amazing. Well, Brad, as we wrap up and get into our final scores here. I'll give mine first. I know you like this movie better than I do, and I don't dislike this movie. In fact, I think more of it works than doesn't work. My big fear is that the parts that we remember, which are undeniably iconic and well-directed, are more few and far between than we actually remember. I don't think you can just sweep under the rug that there really is about 35, 40, 45 minutes of excess at the beginning of this film. And that any time it tries to get sentimental, it loses steam. Mel Gibson doesn't quite know what he's doing as a director. The script gets really schlocky. And so I have to be honest about the fact that, like, for every really good sequence in this movie, there's also a sequence that is a little cringy or poorly directed. And so I come out on the side of, like, yes, I like this movie. Yes, it's well done. Yes, I think two or three scenes are, like, in the all-time great scenes list. But the movie as a whole... I think people should go back and rewatch it and really decide for themselves if the sum of its parts is really as great as we remember it being. 
This movie for me is a 7 out of 10. It's it's a good movie. It's an enjoyable movie. It is competently made, but I don't know if it's anything more than that. Yeah, Bob, I, I completely understand that rating. There's a lot of issues with this movie, but for me, I really do think that the sum of its parts are are really spectacular. You know, it, it's not a perfect movie for me. I don't even think it's a 9 out of 10, but but for me, it is an 8.5 out of 10. I think this is a great movie. It's well worth a rewatch. But in the end, like, you have to decide for yourself. This isn't a movie that you should just let the hype roll you away with. Like Bob said, go back, watch it yourself. Decide if you really love it. You know, this movie has an 8.3 out of 10 on IMDb, which is uh, among the higher movies. You know, that's not a low-ranked movie. IMDb can be pretty brutal when it comes to films. So go back, check it out. And then, honestly, you need to connect with us on social media or give us a call and let us know what you think about the movie. Yeah, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Film Whiskey. Or you can give us a call. Let your voice be heard on the Film and Whiskey podcast. Our phone number is 216-800-5923. Once again, that number is 216-800-5923. Or leave us a voicemail on our Anchor webpage, anchor.fm slash filmwhiskey. Next week, we will be finishing out our series of films from 1995 with the movie that you have chosen, Babe. So please join us next week for that. For the Film and Whiskey Podcast, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time.